And on behalf of the chaplains and the staff here, I'd just like to welcome you to our Thomas E. Golden Jr. Fellowship in Faith and Science. In introducing our speaker, I thought it might be of interest to let you know that Dr. Giannotti received her PhD in experimental particle physics from the University of Milan and was a project leader for the Atlas experiment, during which she played a key role in the discovery of the Higgs boson. It might also be of interest to you that she will be the first woman to be the director of the CERN Particle Physics Lab in Geneva, Switzerland. Or it might be of interest to you that she was on the cover of Time Magazine. She was a contender for the person of the year just behind President Obama. <laughs> or it might be of interest that bringing Dr. Giannotti <laughs> some family members visiting tonight. So no matter what brought you here tonight, please help me warmly welcome Dr. Giannotti. Okay, good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very glad to be with you uh, tonight. And um, I thought that I, uh, that I would like to discuss uh, a topic which is very, very well known um, to, to everybody, the discovery of, of the Higgs boson. Everybody knows about this um, uh, special particle. Um, this discovery represents a very important, a very um, important step forward in our understanding of fundamental uh, physics, so in, in fundamental uh, knowledge. Uh, but tonight I would like to stress a bit the, the relationship with the, between the X boson and um, and our life. So the X boson has been discovered was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, which is the most po powerful accelerator on Earth, and the, the LHC uh, is located at uh, at CERN. So let me spend a couple of slides to uh, um, to explain to you what what CERN is. CERN is the is the is the biggest largest particle physics laboratory in the world. It was, um, it was founded about six years ago. Um, and it's a center of excellence where, um, over the past 60 years, uh, scientists from all over the world have been uh, doing fundamental research uh, awarded by important discoveries and uh, Nobel Prizes given also to uh, physicists from, uh, from CERN. It's also a place where the, uh, the scientific goals require the development of cutting-edge technologies in a huge number of, of domains, of fields, and these techno this technologies are transferred then to uh, society. One example which is very well known is the World Wide Web, which was in, introduced at CERN in the, in the early 90s to, um, to facilitate the exchange of information among the, uh, the scientists involved in, the, in, in experiments at CERN, and since then uh, it has changed the way uh, society um, accesses information. And I will give more examples uh, later on. It's also a place where we, uh, we, uh, we train, where we form um, young, uh, young people, in particular tomorrow scientists. And it's also, uh, it's also a very special and fantastic place to, um, to unify uh, nations and to bring people together because at CERN more than uh, 11,000 scientists from all over the world, about 100 different nationalities, work uh, together um, in, a, in a peaceful way. One, uh, one slide about history. CERN was founded in 1954 by 12 European um, countries, um, thanks also to the vision of, um, of some uh, politicians and some scientists who really imagined what CERN could, could, could become. And among those, actually, a, a US um, physicist, uh, um, uh, Isaac Rabi, a Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, today, it consists of 21 member states, um, all of them from Europe except Israel, who just joined um, last year. The budget is about 1 billion uh, Swiss franc uh, per year. And it's contributed by the member state countries, or by the 21 member states, uh, in a way proportional to their, um, in annual, uh, to their income. So one billion uh, Swiss francs, as I like to, uh, to say as a, as, a, as a comparison, corresponds to uh, one cappuccino per European citizen per year, on average. <laughs> on average means that in southern European countries, the cappuccino is 
very good and very cheap. And then you move north, okay, and it becomes more and more expensive and, uh, okay. Anyway, so uh, this budget is used to pay the salaries of the 2,300 staff people employed by, by CERN and in large part to develop the infrastructure, so accelerators, workshops, um, and other infrastructure that are used by the worldwide um, community of scientists to do um, experiments at, at CERN. So this, this um, figure shows the, the map of the 11,000 uh, scientists from all over the world um, doing experiments at CERN. And you can see that the USA down in the, in the, in the green, um, in the green uh, um, box, actually the US contributes the largest national contingent of, of scientists. Out of 11,000 scientists, 1,700 come from the US. So we used to say that CERN is the second biggest US laboratory in the world. Because the first one is the Fermilab uh, laboratory at, um, at Chicago in Illinois. And actually CERN is the second biggest, biggest US laboratory because, uh, because of the huge uh, US participation. Okay, so apart from these social um, considerations, which are quite important, I will come back to, to them later, uh, CERN's primary mission is science. So what we do at CERN is to, uh, to study the elementary particles, among which uh, we include, um, one can include the building blocks of matters, the so-called electrons and, and, and quarks, and the forces that control their, their, their behavior, their interaction at the most fundamental level. So today we all know that matter is made of, um, of atoms. Um, atoms are made of a central uh, nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. The nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and protons and neutrons are made of more elementary particles, smaller particles called the quarks, which are held together by other elementary particles called gluons, because they glue the, the quarks inside the nucleus. So as far as we know today, Quarks and electrons are elementary particles, mean, meaning that they cannot be cut into smaller um, pieces. And they are the fundamental constituent of ordinary matter. So everything in this, in this room, in the screen, um, myself, all of you, the food and uh, this table, everything is made of electron and quark. So we are an ensemble of electron and quarks and a lot of empty space because the radius of the atom is very, is very big co compared to the size of the, of the nucleus. So particle physics at modern accelerators and the Large Hadron Collider is the, most, is the most powerful of them, allows us to study uh, matter, to, to, to scrutinize, to <coughs> test matter, to probe matter uh, at the scale of quarks. That is on uh, scales of the order of one billionth of a billionth of a meter. So these accelerators can be seen as giant microscopes that allow us to study not so much cells, but even smaller um, objects uh, li like the quarks. Uh, at the same time, these studies allow us to um, understand um, some of the, uh, the feature, feature of the universe, its structure and its evolution. So the very small allow us to uh, understand uh, the, the very big. And the reason is that we know today that the, the, the universe um, at the origin about 14 billion years ago um, from a big explosion, the so-called Big Bang, and uh, at the beginning it was very hot and very dense and then it expanded and cooled down. At the beginning it was made of three elementary particles and then with time and with cooling these particles started to, um, to get together to form nuclei and then atoms and then the light elements and then uh, the, micro the macro structure that we know today, uh, planets, galaxies, stars, etc. But because at the beginning the universe was made of elementary particles, by studying elementary particles at accelerators, uh, we can understand the, the, the phenomena, the interaction that have characterized the, the, the universe at the very, the, very, the very early instance of its life. So this kind of studies that we, we, we make with accelerators address the universe in the very um, first instance of its life and are complementary to what telescopes do. They explore mainly the macro structures we see today, uh, like the galaxies and etc. So how do we do so in, 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 in practice? So what we do, and I, um, now what I'm saying uh, in, the, in, the, in the following uh, few slides is, uh, I will try to simplify the picture so it's not really scientific, it's not scientifically 
a very, uh, very rigorous, but just for the sake of explaining, uh, <coughs> sorry, what, 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 what are the basic fundamental uh, methods that we use. So we accelerate uh, two beams of um, particles, for instance, two beams of protons, and we make them collide at very high energy. So this is uh, done through accelerators. Accelerators are usually um, underground, uh, underground rings. They can, they, can all, they can also be linear, but usually they are the Large Hadron Collider in particular is a circular accelerator. And what you see here in this picture is a view of the underground tunnel, 27 kilometer circumference, housing the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. An accelerator is made essentially of two, two main elements, it's much more complicated of course, but it's mainly made of two elements, uh, electric field and magnetic field. Electric field are used to accelerate the particles by giving them a kick uh, um, incrementally at every turn. Whereas magnetic fields are used to keep the, uh, the beams on their, on their orbits and to bring them in, in, into collision. And actually these blue tubes that you see there, actually they, they house uh, very high-tech superconducting magnets that are the, uh, the main uh, element of their success and the possibility of reaching the high energy of the large Hadron collider. Okay, so we collide the two beams and what happens in the collision? So you can imagine that in the collision of the two protons, essentially three main things Three main interesting things happen. The first one is that the two protons break into thousands of pieces. It's not really um, scientifically rigorous, but you can imagine two trucks or two Ferraris uh, <laughs> colliding at high energy. Of course, the higher the collision energy, the more the two, the two cars or the two trucks you know, are, 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 are broken into, in, into pieces. So we, we can understand how the elementary constituent of the protons, the quarks and the gluons, interact uh, and understand the behavior of um, elementary, the, the, the elementary constituent of matter. So this is the first uh, thing that is interesting to do. The second thing is that in the collision, a lot of energy is produced from the collision of these two uh, beams, um, um, very energetic two beams. So, and from this energy, new particles can materialize because we know from Einstein that energy and matter E equal mc squared means that energy and matter are uh, two different manifestations of the same point. So the energy of the two beams allows to produce new particles. And the higher the energy, the more massive the produced particle can be. So particles that were not accessible in the past because too <coughs> heavy to be produced at previous accelerators become accessible at the Large Hadron Collider because it has much more energy. And it's actually what, uh, what happened with the Higgs boson, which is not super heavy, it's, uh, it's a heavy particle which is rarely produced. So the ensemble of the things of being relatively heavy and also having very weak interactions uh, made that it was never observed before and it, was, uh, it has been produced for the first time, at least observed for the first time at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012, 11 and 12. And then the third thing that we do is that uh, with this accelerator in some sense we are able to go backward in time because the energy that we produce in the, uh, in the collision corresponds to a given temperature. Actually the, the temperature of the collision at the LHC are of the level of 10 to the 16 Kelvin means more or less uh, 100,000 billion times the temperature in this room. And I said before that the universe, well, I didn't say that, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what we know today, that the universe had origin from a big explosion and then with time it cooled down, it expanded and it cooled down. So if you ask, uh, if you ask the temperature that we produce in the, uh, in the collision of the LHC, at what time of the history of, uh, of the universe do they correspond? And so they correspond to the, to the temperature that the universe had uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang. So one millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. So we reproduce the same energy and temperature condition of the very early, early universe. And this also gives us, again, a lot of information on how um, the universe evolved um, with time. So this is what happens in the collision, so it's very interesting. And then in order to, uh, in order to um, um, understand, uh, uh, to, to, you know, to, to take a picture of the collision, we use, um, we use uh, instruments that are called uh, particle detectors. So we surround the collision points with high-tech instruments, devices, particle detectors, that allow us ideally to detect, reconstruct, identify, measure, 
ideally every single particle produced in the collisions and therefore to deduce to have a full picture of the collision event and then uh, be able to interpret what happened in, in, in the collision itself and so be able to understand if in that particular event uh, X boson has been produced or um, what kind of phenomenon was, uh, was at play. Now the most powerful accelerator and the most complex uh, detectors have been developed in the framework of the Large Hadron Collider which is one of the most ambitious projects in, in, in science in general and, and ever and that require the, uh, the development of innovative concepts and te technologies and the efforts of the, the worldwide um, community over more than 20 years. First, uh, first ideas about the interest of such a collider were discussed in uh, 1984 and first uh, collisions happened in November 2009. So it's a very, very long, uh, long uh, project that, uh, that requires a huge amount of, um, of efforts, a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of ideas also to solve many, many problems and uh, big, very big challenges. So the, uh, the LHC is, a, is, a, is an accelerator um, housed in an underground ring of 27 kilometers. So this picture shows a view of the Geneva region. Uh, the little dots show the border between France and Switzerland. Switzerland is on the bottom part uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the little dots and uh, France is the top part. So you see on the bottom, in the bottom part of the, of the figure Geneva Airport, then uh, uh, Lake Geneva is on the right hand side of the, of, of the picture and uh, the, the, the circle uh, indicates the location of the accelerator ring which is not visible at the surface because it's 100 meter uh, below ground. And between 2010 and 2013, uh, two high-energy proton beams have been circulated in the two opposite directions and have been uh, brought into collision uh, at the four points, in four points of the, of the ring where the, the four uh, <coughs> yellow stars are, um, are drawn. And in these four points of the ring, four big caverns have been excavated. And in these four big caverns, four big particle detectors have been installed and these detectors have been recording the collisions of the two beams and studying and analyzing uh, the data. The collision energy was, has been, until now, four times larger than what achieved previously, and the previous energy record was um, obtained, achieved at the Tevatron Collider at Fermilab here in the US, in Chicago. Um, and uh, so we, we were able to achieve an energy four times larger, and um, in a few months from now, we will resume operation after two years of shutdown to perform some uh, uh, improvements and to uh, consolidation and repairs and we will be able to increase the energy by, another, by another factor of 1.5. Now, as I mentioned before, the single most challenging and also most important and essential element to be able to achieve uh, such unprecedented energies uh, has been uh, the, um, the development of almost 1200, more than 1,200 high-technology superconducting uh, magnets which are able to keep the high energy proton beams in the right orbit within a uh, few microns, where a micron is a, is a millionth of, of, of a meter. And these magnets are made of 8,000 kilometers of superconducting material, niobium titanium. So it's a quite, uh, they are the jewel of, of technology and uh, the most advanced, uh, uh, this is the most advanced uh, um, deployment of superconductive, massive superconductive uh, material. <coughs> So uh, I mentioned that in the four, uh, the two beams collide at four points. So in these four points, four um, big experiments have been installed underground. underground. They're called ATLAS and, um, and CMS. And ATLAS and CMS are the two biggest experiments, those that observe the Higgs boson, this new, uh, this new particle, and reported announced this discovery on, uh, on July uh, 4, 2012. And uh, two other smaller experiments, but a lot less important, called um, ALICE and LHCB. And, and teams from, uh, from Yale actually uh, are involved in ATLAS and in ALICE, have made very strong contribution. And in general, the US, US laboratories and universities contribute in a very crucial way to the four experiments and to the accelerator. So also, um, 
challenging and also uh, you know, requiring big jump in concept and technologies um, are the, the detectors. So this is the Atlas detector, it's a sketch of the Atlas detector, it's the, it's the biggest of the four uh, experiments. Uh, you can see, you can appreciate the size compared to two human beings, you see uh, two uh, little uh, a man and, uh, and a woman because we promote equal opportunities, we always put men and women in our, in our pictures to be, uh, to be politically correct. And uh, so you see, it's, uh, well you see, I tell you, it's uh, 45 meter long, uh, it's 25 meter high, so it's almost a five story uh, building, so you will ask why it's so big, because of course if you want to measure and to absorb the high energy particles produced in the collision, high energy collision of the two beams, you need big volumes, you cannot you cannot uh, you you cannot stop uh, um, um, a high energy particle just in few in few centimeters. At the same time, we want to reconstruct uh, ideally every single particle emerging from the collision point with very high precision precision of a few microns, where a micron is a, a millionth of a meter. So you can see on the bottom picture, on the right bottom picture, uh, the collision of uh, an event. Um, a collision event recorded by the CMS experiment, the two beams have coll coll collided in the center, and you can see from the central yellow point several other points and tracks emerging, and uh, uh, the, red, uh, the, red, the red towers indicate energy deposition in the detector, and so we have to be able to reconstruct every single trajectory with very high precision. And so these detectors are made of hundred millions of uh, high technology sensors, most of them are, are pixel, silicon uh, pixel, to be able to reconstruct the event with high precision. So this detector can be uh, considered a kind of giant um, digital camera which take pictures of the uh, collision of the two, uh, of the two uh, beams and allow us then to develop the, the pictures and to interpret what happened in the collision. But this camera must be extremely fast because the two beams collide 40 million times a second. So we are not going to, we will not actually record all these collisions because there will not be enough computing power to analyze all of them. Only a few hundred of them are recorded, but in principle the detector must be so fast to be able to react to 40 million collisions per second. Okay. Also, also impressive uh, is, the, is the size and geographical spread of the collaboration of scientists involved in each one of these experiments. So for instance, this is for the Atlas uh, experiment, the uh, worldwide map uh, of the countries involved in Atlas. In yellow, the countries that are uh, working in the experiment, and you see they go from the US to South America, to um, Australia, South Africa, China, Russia, Europe, um, etc. So in total, 3,000 scientists from um, 38 countries from all over the world, and the US participate in Atlas in particular with 41 universities and laboratories, a total of 600 scientists, and many of them are students and they, um, they have contributed in a very important way to all aspects of the experiment. And there is a, a team from Yale uh, contributed with 25 scientists. Am I right, Paul? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so um, let me show this picture that I like very much. It shows the age distribution of the Atlas population. So we have 3,000 scientists in Atlas, okay, and so if you plot the age of the, uh, of the scientists, you get this, uh, this picture in blue for boys and in pink for girls. <laughs> <laughs> and you see that most, most of, the, of these scientists are young people. So first of all, one third of them are PhD students and 50% of them are below 30, 35. In particular, Paul Tipton and myself are in the first beam, below 25, and we will not move, we will not move from there, no, right? <coughs> but you can also see, you can also see that uh, well, the fraction of women is around uh, 20%, but you see that this fraction increases uh, toward the, the, in the younger generation, so there are more and more young women uh, you know, um, participating, uh, working on fundamental research and participating in experimental research. So a few more numbers, so the, uh, well, just a couple of them. Uh, the superconducting magnets that are the core of the accelerator, as I mentioned before, um, have to work, I mean, must work at low temperature because only at low temperature uh, a material is, has a, the, displays superconducting uh, capabilities and the, the temperature at, what, at which the magnets work is 
1.9 Kelvin. 1.9 Kelvin corresponds to minus 171 degrees uh, Celsius, so only two degrees from the absolute zero, uh, which makes the LHC the, the, the coldest uh, point, uh, the coldest place in, in the universe, and also the cooler place in the universe. The coldest place in the universe because, uh, again, if you ask yourself what is the temperature of the universe today, uh, temperature of um, outer space is 3 Kelvin on average and the, and the LHC operates at 1.9 Kelvin, so we are, we are colder than, uh, than, than outer space. Uh, the CMS experiments contains more iron than the 2FL in Paris and weighs more than, uh, than, than it. And uh, in Atlas we use 3,000 kilometers, we need 3,000 kilometers of cables to transfer the signal from the underground detector to the um, control rooms uh, in, uh, at the surface. So clearly the question is why uh, this, um, this big adventure, um, human and technological and scientific um, adventure. So the reason is that uh, the, uh, the elementary particles, among which uh, the quarks and the electrons that are the, the fundamental constituent of matters, uh, are very well known today thanks to um, almost 50 years of uh, very um, high quality uh, experimental works uh, made um, at laboratories all over, all over the world, uh, discoveries on many elementary particles, measurement of their interaction, so we have learned a lot over the past 50 years. We also have a theory, which is called the standard model, that, uh, that describes these elementary particles and their interaction with great accuracy. Uh, in that all the particles that the standard model uh, has foreseen have been observed experimentally. The last one is the Higgs boson, uh, the, the, the only one that was missing. Um, and uh, the theory has been verified with very high precision by, uh, by the experiments. So this is very positive. Uh, the problem is that um, there are several outstanding questions in fundamental physics to which uh, the standard model and our present knowledge of, the, uh, of particle physics uh, uh, are not able to, um, to, to answer. Uh, one, uh, one question, mystery, that has been with us for uh, 50 years is the origin of the, uh, of the masses of the elementary particles, which is a question related to the Higgs boson. Now the Higgs boson has been discovered, so <coughs> the question, the problem has been solved at least in large part, but there are many others. And for me and for many of, uh, of us physicists, uh, not only particle physicists, but in general you know, also cosmologists and astroparticle physicists, one of the, one of the, of the, of the main uh, problem is the so-called dark universe. So 95% uh, of the universe is dark to us. Uh, meaning that when we, for instance, in the, in, in the evening, we look at the sky and we see the nice stars and galaxies and planets, what we see is only 5% of the universe. This means that only 5% of the universe is made of ordinary matter, so atoms, elements, chemical elements, the same matters of which we are made. The rest, 95%, is made of a form of matter and energy that we don't know. Uh, dark, and we call, for this reason, we call them dark energy and dark matter. Dark for two reasons. First of all, dark indicates our ignorance, but dark also indicates that this energy and matter do not interact with our instruments. So we infer their existence in an indirect way from some observation, like the gravitation, gravitational motion of galaxies, etc. So this is a big question mark. Today, 95% of the universe is unknown and remains unknown. So. DLHC uh, will try in the coming years to shed lights at least on the, in the mystery of dark, uh, dark matter if, uh, if the, the, the particles that are responsible for dark matter are accessible uh, to the LHC and there are a certain type of, of, of particle, weakly interacting massive particles. If they are made of other kind of um, particles then this is difficult for the LHC. And there are many other uh, questions like why the universe is mainly made of uh, matter with so little antimatter, etc., etc. So we now spend uh, just one slide and a couple of a few words on the X boson to try to explain in a very simple way why it's, it's so important. So. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, over the past 50 years we have been asking ourselves uh, uh, what is the origin of the, of, the, of the masses of the elementary particles. So in particular, why the photon, 
<coughs> an elementary particle, which is very mm, you know, mm, common in our life. This room is, is full of photons. There are, there are light, this light, light is made of photons. So the photons is massless, it's pure energy, and travels at the speed of light. Uh, the photon at the level of uh, quantum mechanics, at the level of elementary particles, is responsible, is responsible for transmitting the um, electromagnetic interaction between two charged particles, for instance, between two electrons. There are other particles, uh, like the W and the Z particles, which have a similar task. They transmit uh, another type of force, the weak force between two elementary particles, and the weak force is uh, responsible for uh, radioactive decays or for the thermonuclear reaction in the sun. So these particles, which are which have a similar task uh, as the photon, but for different interaction, weak instead of electromagnetic, uh, are massive. They have mass which is typically 100 times the mass of the proton. So this was not really, uh, it was not really clear how this can, can happen. What is the mechanism that allows some particles to acquire mass by while leaving some other particle massless. So uh, in 1964, so more or less 50 years ago, uh, a group of scientists among which um, the leading contribution has been made by uh, Robert Braut, a US Belgian scientist, Francois Angler, a Belgian, uh, a Belgian scientist, and Peter Higgs, a British scientist, introduced um, a mechanism in the theory, in the standard model, that um, allows to um, explain the, the, the mass differences between the photon and the W and the, and the, Z, and the Z particle. And according to this mechanism, uh, the, the masses of the particle had origin about 10 to the minus 11 seconds after the Big Bang. So you have to imagine, just after the Big Bang, all particles are massless. They all travel at the speed of light. Uh, in the universe, and uh, they are all very, all very happy, etc. Then, with uh, well, they are happy also afterwards. But anyway, uh, they, they were particularly happy when they, they were um, traveling at the speed of light. Then, uh, then time passes, and the universe cools down. And at some point, and this point happens 10 to the minus 11 second after the big bang. So, 100 of a billionth of a second after the big bang, the Higgs mechanism or the Higgs field. Uh, um, um, c c comes in, into, in, into, in, into play. So you have to imagine, if, in, a, in a simplified way, it's like if the, the universe gets permeated by a field, so gets permeated by a medium, and imagine this medium as a kind of you know, sticky medium glue, and the particles now, they were previously you know, running happily in an in a empty universe, now start to feel that there's something in the universe, in, the, in, the sp in space, and this something is quite sticky, so they start to interact with this sticky material and they get fatter and fatter and they are slowed down. So this is the mechanism explained in a very simple, in a very simple and scientifically non-rigorous way, is the mechanism that allows elementary particles to get a mass. Um, so this was the only way, only, well, the main, the main solution to the problem, uh, but the consequence of this mechanism is that the theory uh, of Braut and Glare Higgs predicts the existence of another elementary particle called the Higgs boson. If the mechanism is correct, then the Higgs boson must exist. And uh, over the past 50 years, this particle has been looked, has been hunted everywhere uh, in all um, accelerators and laboratories and was not found. So there was no proof until 2012 that this mechanism was um, actually the correct, why, the correct one until we have found it at the, at, the, at the LHC, and this proved that indeed this is the right mechanism, so we have understood the origin of masses, at least for, uh, for, um, for, for the, uh, the photon and W and the Z, and, uh, and as a result, so, so as you know, uh, Francois Angler and uh, Peter Higgs got the, Nobel, the Physics Nobel Prize in, uh, in 2013. Robert Braut, unfortunately, passed away in 2011, so was not able to, to share the Nobel Prize with them. So I'm sure that at this point you would ask a question or you would raise a point. The point is, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so, who cares? So who cares about this mechanism, you know, the uh, Higgs field, the particle mass, etc., the photon which is massless and W and Z boson have a mass? Well, the point is that if electrons 
did not have a mass, atom, the atoms will not stick together. So there will be no chemical elements, no chemistry, no matter. If the quarks did not have a mass, the proton will decay, will not exist. So there will be no matter. We will not be here, and the universe will not exist, at least in the form that it, it is today. And this is the first link to our life. Without this particle, uh, we, we will not be here. So what is it? How did we observe it? How does it uh, manifest itself in our in our experiment. Uh, so the, the, the Higgs boson, once, once produced, was expected to uh, decay, so to disintegrate itself immediately into um, other known particles. In particular, it was expected to uh, decay immediately into two photons, which are two well, very well known particles, which can be well measured by our detectors. So Atlas and CMS uh, have looked at, the, um, at those uh, events in their data containing two photons and they look at the spectrum and uh, you expect to a uh, smooth spectrum but if a particle of a given specific mass is produced you expect to see a, a, a peak a line a, 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 in uh, at that given mass and this is what we have observed if you look at the bottom part of the of the uh, of the figure you see that there is a nice a nice peak the, the, the data point in black show a nice peak around a mass of about 130 times the mass of the proton, and that's it, that is the explosion. It was not easy to find, not only because, of course, we had to build a very uh, high-tech detectors and instrument detectors and accelerator, but also because a detectable X particle is produced every uh, thousand billion proton-proton collisions. So it's like uh, looking for a needle not in one haystack but in many haystacks and required a lot of ingenuity and a huge amount of very meticulous and very clever experimental work which was made in large part by by the young people of the, uh, the experience so often people ask me and my colleagues if the x boson will change our life and my usual uh, answer is that it did change our life already because in order to discover it, we had to develop a huge number of technology in several fields that uh, find application now in many other, um, other um, domains. I already mentioned the World Wide Web. Um, vacuum technologies developed at CERN are used today in uh, solar panels, and you find in that box many other examples. But I would like to insist on one point. Uh, today, there exists on Earth something like 30,000 particle accelerators. Only a handful of them are used in fundamental research at CERN and in other uh, laboratories. All of them have been built based on technologies developed at CERN and on uh, other laboratories doing particle physics. And they are used, they are employed, most of them, uh, those, uh, most of those 30,000, for medical application, imaging and, uh, and cancer ter uh, therapy. So, for instance, one of the of the spin-off, important spin-off, is the so-called hadron therapy, where we um, the the, uh, the uh, tumor uh, tissue is bombarded with uh, protons of light or light um, ions, like carbon ions, and this radiation, this, this, these particles have the, uh, have, the, have the advantage of being very much collimated and focused. So they only hit and destroy the uh, tumor tissue and not expand in the good uh, cells around it unlike X-rays. So this is a, 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 a therapy which is used in 45 facilities worldwide, and many of them actually in the, uh, in the, in the US, and have been uh, now thousands of, more than 100,000 patients have been uh, treated worldwide. And this is the second link to our life. So in conclusion, uh, at CERN, we, um, in particular with the Large Hadron Collider, we seek answers to fundamental questions about um, elementary particles and the structural evolution of the, of the universe. And with the advent of the LHC, uh, a new era started with exploration of a, of a new energy scale, an unprecedented energy scale. And, this, uh, and this eff these efforts have been already awarded by um, with the discovery of x boson, which is a very special particle that we try to underline and uh, has allowed a big step forward in, in fundamental science. I also stress the importance of fundamental science for advancing technologies and for innovation. However, let me stress that fundamental knowledge and fundamental research justify itself per se uh, 
knowledge is a right and a duty of human being as clever being, like, like art. Uh, knowledge and art as among the highest intellectual expression of human being as clever beings. Since the time we are on Earth, the first, the first, uh, you know, the first human beings, you know, were exploring nature. They were painting on on uh, on, uh, on 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 covered walls. So, uh, not funding fundamental research because it doesn't have an immediate impact the day after, now and day by day lives, like denying the um, the nature uh, of uh, of the nature of the uh, of, of human beings. Uh, another important thing that we do at CERN is to promote diversity, as I try to, to, to stress, diversity in all, um, in all terms, gender, age, ethnicity, because this is a, a, a strong asset, not only for better science, but also for peace and for better, for better society. Thank you. I would be interested, I suspect everyone would be interested in knowing what brought you to where it is that you now are. What were the influences, given that you're a fan in this field? What brought, what, yes. what brought me into particle physics? Yes. So, first of all, what brought me into physics? Um, Curiosity. I was very, very curious. When I was a child, I was extremely curious. I wanted to know, you know, all the details of everything. And at that time, the, the, the web did mm, not exist. Uh, so I had to ask, uh, I could not Google, uh, you know, and look for, uh, for information on the web. So, on the web. so I, 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 of course, I, I used to ask those questions to teachers and uh, family, and uh, often I found uh, finding this, the, the answer not so satisfying. So I was very curious, and when, and then, I, so I loved, for instance, um, philosophy because, of course, it addresses the fundamental question. But then, at some point, I, I sort of thought that physics uh, would allow me to help address those questions and, and getting some answers because, you know, science is something that you know addresses questions and tries to find answer and uh, and progress. Uh, that's what that's what brought me to into physics and then particle physics because particle physics is the most fundamental of all physics because it really goes to the uh, uh, fundamental constituent of matter. So again, the the, 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 the passion, the wish of knowing more and more of the, the building blocks of uh, matter, universe, the universe. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, recently, I read a, a very general article about quantum physics in one of those great physics journals, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, I'm not sure which it was, but it was a, a summary. And it mentioned that when, shortly after the Big Bang, not only were, was that big field set up, but the key physical constants of the universe were set up at that moment. And it said something to the effect that if one of the forces about how those particles bind together were off by as little as 1 in 10 to the 14, atoms could not exist. If you don't mind my asking as a continuation of Dr. Duffy's question, how has that affected your own sense of faith? Or could you talk a bit about your faith in terms of this faith in science, not sure how that works and how do you feel about that? So you are touching clearly a very, a very interesting question. It seems that we, mm, the universe in, uh, in, uh, um, in which we live is, as we call it in, uh, in our um, jargon, is fine-tuned. That is, we exist because because a certain number of important numbers and parameters, like the masses of the elementary particles and, uh, and many, uh, the energy uh, of, uh, you know, of, the, uh, of, the, of the universe itself, the, 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 the uh, how to say, um, yeah, the, um, what is called the dark energy, or I don't want to go into, into details, but uh, some other parameters related to the expansion of the universe are, are uh, exactly what they are. And if they were just slightly different, we would not be here. So this is something very, very intriguing and very, and very um, puzzling. Uh, as a scientist, for me, it's, a, it's extremely puzzling. And um, of course, we don't know yet if it's 
really true. I and mean, we think so, but we, we're still looking for, for possible alternatives. There are other alternatives like you know multi, multi, multiverses and things like that. Um, another thing that really um, impresses me a lot is that uh, nature and the laws of physics are extremely um, symmetric. Uh, the fundamental laws of physics, uh, for example, interactions among the elementary particles are um, um, obtained by applying some symmetry principle that will be a bit, bit long to explain. However, we do exist because of tiny asymmetries in these symmetries. So the X boson itself represents a breaking of the symmetry. Uh, the asymmetry, I mean, the, 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 the overwhelming uh, amount of matter compared to antimatter is also little asymmetry at some point of the history of the universe. So this is also very puzzling. Uh, I myself think that there must be some, there is order in the universe, there is elegance in the universe, there must be a clever mind behind it. I, I refuse to think that uh, it's just, uh, you know, just a case, it's just random that we are happen to live in one of uh, you know bi the billions of different universe, and uh, we are so lucky to be in the one. Thank you, in the one that uh, that has the right conditions. For me, it's uh, you know it's like uh, um, right, yeah, being being uh, in some sense. Uh, um, <coughs> <coughs> Difficult to explain. Uh, I, I think that there must be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, clever mind behind who has orchestrated all that. It's, for me, it's very, it's, it's, it's very hard to believe it's just, uh, you know, random thing. There is a hand over. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for such an inspiring talk. It was really beautiful and very clearly communicated. Um, I'm a female geoscience PhD student, and I'm wondering what advice you have for the next generation of female scientists in both overcoming gender and those barriers. Um, say it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Just curious, with um, women in science, uh, especially physical sciences, there's questions about continuing, uh, continuing academic track and not falling off that. And what advice do you have? Continue pushing even when there are uh, sometimes barriers uh, based on gender. So, um, my opinion is that, of course, uh, being a woman, a woman in physics or in fundamental science is very nice. It's very, uh, it's fantastic, and uh, uh, I think you, I, I think. One has to be extremely positive, and one has to think that um, nowadays. Um, men and women have very have similar, similar opportunities. Uh, uh, there are many, many women at CERN in uh, very high responsibility positions. I'm not the only one. Uh, uh, there are many women project leaders, uh, conveners of physics groups, coordinators of uh, responsible of the safety in the underground cavern. So it's uh, of course, there is some history. You know, there are less women than men, also for historical reasons, because the hard sciences in uh, till two years ago were not really considered to be the best uh, investment for the future for women, for various reasons. But I think that now things are changing. So I will really encourage all young women who want to undertake an activity in, in fundamental research, be it physics or mathematics or anything else. To do so with with with, uh, with enthusiasm, with determination, of course, as always in life, and also in your private private life, you have to be determined. Uh, you have to be enthusiastic. You have to, uh, in any profession, in any in any in any job. So, never give up um, uh, to uh, challenges, to difficulties, because there are always difficulties in life, not only in physics, and uh, and also do things with uh, with a lot of modesty, because only if we are modest, we can really. You know, first of all, give the best of ourselves. But also, when you when you, when you when you work very close to the fundamental knowledge, you realize how little we, we know. Okay, we made a lot of progress, but 95% of the universe, we don't know what's there. So, so 
that should stimulate us to, to so don't give up, especially if you are aware. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll just ask Start with the first one. And <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you must, you know, spend some time speaking to a lot of people like us who know very little about this, and it's such a complex topic that. Um, we probably don't understand it very well by the end, um, but I'm just wondering, you know, are there certain um, misconceptions or um, things that people think about CERN or what you do that frustrate you or, um, po you know, any kind of popular misconceptions? Okay, so the first uh, the first thing that, uh, that uh, puzzles me is when I see uh, you know, uh, eight years old um, kids say, I hate maths. How is it possible that eight year old kids hate maths? Maths is fantastic, it's, you know, it's a kind of intellectual game. Because mathematics, mathematics and physics, often they are not really taught in the, in, in the right way. Physics is, is relatively simple. If you look at the fundamental laws of nature, they are simple, they are elegant, they are beautiful, they can be written in little piece of paper. Um, so I, I think there is a, the wrong approach of considering, you know, hard sciences like, you know, kind of uh, so difficult, so, uh, you know, um, intricate and not accessible. So this is the first thing. Concerning CERN um, and the other, you know, your question about what puzzled me, it's what I was saying at the end of my presentation, that society today wants, appreciates, seems to appreciate um, society, perhaps government, perhaps, I don't know, uh, people seem to appreciate or to support only things that give us benefits, visible, practical benefits in the short term. Okay. So science, for instance, is supported, but what kind of science or research is supported? Mainly applied research. Okay. Industry supports applied research. Uh, because applied research is something that targets a given product and gives you a result in a few years. And of course, industry has to invest money. That. Governments who should, who should, who should uh, fund fundamental research actually also like to, um, uh, to fund research that gives results within the political cycle of... Uh, in Italy, the political cycle is three months, so you can imagine that uh, because the government can... Uh, change every, every few months. So, so jokes aside, uh, fundamental research uh, is really the fuel of, of progress. Fundamental research, because it doesn't have any constraints, applied research is started to something. Fundamental research is just, you know, freedom for people to have ideas, to express their creativity, their, their ingenuity. And this and this brings very often two very transformational ideas that have impact, strong impact on mankind. But it requires time. And very often the impact comes after decades. I'll give you an example. There's nothing more, apparently more decoupled from reality and far away from day-to-day -day life than quantum mechanics and relativity. Well, to, to the average person, this seems to be something, you know, completely abstract and uh, quite, 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 quite complex. Uh, and these are discoveries of the, of the, of the beginning of the, of the, of the, um, of the last century. But without quantum mechanics, transistor will not exist. So all the gadget we use will not be there. Without relativity, if you would did not correct your GPS for, you know, uh, uh, the signal from the satellite for relativistic effect, the GPS will not work, okay? But of course it required decades before quantum mechanics and Einstein theory were uh, transformed into something useful for society, but thank goodness this was done and, 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 and now we, we benefit from it. So fundamental science, fundamental research requires a lot of patience and often society is, you know, does not have this patience. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. So, two things that I uh, listen right now from you is that you mentioned how uh, two of the highest uh, expressions of human being are science and art, right? 
and now that you're talking about how basic knowledge from science, math, chemistry, physics, uh, maybe it's not really well taught from the beginning, right? So we can promote it in the future. Is there any way of experiments or research, kind of research that you're doing, scientists with artists, to huh. maybe understand each other a little more? About each yes. Other? Well, there is a, the, uh, at CERN we have a program which is called Arts at CERN, which brings together, which brings some uh, scientists, uh, some sorry, some artists on site, um, dancers, um, painters, sculptors, uh, and they come on site and they get inspired from what we do and try to, you know, to uh, to to translate what they see, to interpret what they see in their in their language. Uh, I must say that I. I, I feel that there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, um, beauty in, uh, as I mentioned before, in, in, in what we, in what in physics. Um, I, I mentioned before the the, the, the the beauty of the fundamental uh, fundamental laws of nature. Of course, we all we are all uh, we all admire the, the, the beautiful the beautiful elegance of the universe at the macroscopic level. But also, if you come and visit, for instance, our experiments, or if you come and visit CERN. Uh, you will see that detectors or uh, instruments that have not been uh, built having in mind as requirements, aesthetical requirements, but just for their use and for their purpose, actually they are really, really beautiful. They have their uh, aesthetic value in some sense. So, um, so yes, there are strong links and we have, uh, we have artists on site and trying to you know, collaborate with us and getting inspired and trans translating what they see in their, in their language. So I'll take that as an invitation for all the scientists and artists and dancers to get and together. To come to CERN. To come to CERN and get together, yes. And with that I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Thank you.